Gig Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 289. It is 289 for Wednesday, January 27th, 2021. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, or welcome back to Gig Gab. Everybody's welcome here. The show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napoma, California, it's Paul Kent. Paul, since the last time you and I spoke, the uh, the door, the entrance, the barricade to my studio has been breached. <laughs> <laughs> I have had... Uh, I have had two members of Fling in here twice since uh, since we spoke last. We got together both I have, both I have Mondays. Visions of of uh, Life of Brian dancing through my head right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, yeah. We, um, you know, like I, like I said in the last show, we're all fortunate enough to be on the university's testing plan because we're all teaching classes this, there this spring, and uh, and they have essentially a rapid PCR test lab, like we. We all drop our tests off before 9 a.m. and we have our results before, like, sometimes even before noon. It's crazy. So, you know, we, we've we been laying low anyway, obviously having all those awkward conversations about the things that we are doing and, and you know, and then we felt comfortable getting together. Um, Who's we? So it's been Russ, uh, Mike, and me. So our two guitar players and me. But rewinding back to the early days of Fling, uh there was no bass player. So Rice, Russ and Mike would, would switch off uh, playing bass and guitar. So that's essentially what we've been doing for the, for the gigs or for the rehearsals these, these last two weeks. And I tell you what, man, it's been, I've obviously had the opportunity to play a bunch, especially in relative to, you know, other people's opportunities during the, the pandemic here, but getting together and playing got with guys that I've, been playing with for, you know, more than 10 years, um, for a lot more than 10 years, actually, uh, you know, and playing songs that we just know, like the ability to just play without having to think about, Oh, am I getting this right? What's the form of this song? I mean, we, we've actually been playing around with some new stuff, but we've also just played some old stuff. Now there was, <laughs> there was muscle memory for a lot of it. There was mu not muscle memory for some of it. And we found that out as we went through some of these things, but, but it really, there's a different feeling playing with people that you just know. Yeah. yeah I mean, I know we all know this, but it like, I've, I've, I had forgotten exactly what that was like. So, you know, I'm going to pause you here because I have like a really useful reflection. So, as I've been sitting here trying to figure out what I'm going to do with my musical life in this new place that I've moved to. Sure. And I think about, well, you know, it'd be nice to have kind of a band to do some things down here. I mean, most of what I want to do down here is solo, mm. but you know, why not? You know? Sure. And then I'm like, but wait a second, where would we rehearse? Cause you know, where I live, it wouldn't be set up for that. So all of a sudden that's a problem now. Right. And I don't have a PA down here. That's a problem now. Like all the things that are kind of built into a well-oiled machine of a band that's kind of up and running where you've solved all those things, the little kind of functional activities that it takes to make a, a band an ongoing concern. Yeah. You, you kind of take for granted that when those things are, are done. I mean, to reinvent them once you've had them is actually a bit of an effort I find. And so. Oh, you know, it's a huge effort. I mean, I, you know, when I moved into this house, what, 15 years ago, I built this room, I acquired gear, uh, you know, I mean, it, it's a major undertaking to create a rehearsal space, uh, yeah. you know, it's, yeah, it's a major. And then deal. add to that, just the, you take for granted what uh, it feels like to have a nice, a nice, a nice warm glove, or, you know, I guess from where you live, a nice warm set of mittens that is the people that you, <laughs> that you, <laughs> that you play with, you know, yeah. where you just get together and there's a certain amount of in, intuition that goes back and forth. Which That's what it is. Play. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. the comfort of knowing a guy likes to fill this type of space in this type of way and making music, once you've kind of worked out the getting to know each other, you take that for granted a little bit. I, I kind of was thinking about, remember when we had, um, Little Feet play at that event at Macworld. Yeah. And yeah. and you and I were backstage. We got to meet the the guys. And this was clearly, you know, a group of people who, you know, like like 
you know, one of the guys was introducing us to the other guys and there was a, um, uh, a comfort to the rapport that they had. And again, this is a band that's been together a long time. Decades at that, at that right. point. Right. Yeah. And, and they went then another you saw, decade. Yeah. You saw like an essence of that tone of communication between two. And again, I don't know if they're all, you know, best friends or anything like that, but clearly they, their work relationship is very well defined. And then they get on stage and then they just, it's butter, right? It's just, yeah. it all just kind of goes together. That's the other thing about, about, you know, this, pandemic and bands not being able to be regular with each other and and to take this out just one step further if this really is going to be august or september until this comes around that's 18 freaking months since there's been any regularity mm -hmm. everything is going to be starting again if you can if you can reclaim like what you have just done with fling if you can reclaim any part of your mojo i think that that's a well, A, it's a, I think it's a tactical advantage that you'll be more ready to hit the ground running than most. But B, you know, that intangible thing about, you know, musicians who have comfort with each other and how that translates into playing. A lot of bands are going to take six months, nine months to get that back, especially if you're only playing once a month or something like that. Yeah. It's, I don't think it's going to come back right away for most cover bands if you haven't played for 12 to 18 months. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I, I think it... It depends on the band. It depends on the musicians. It depends on, you know, we've, and we've had this conversation, how in touch you are keeping with one another, even though you're not playing music, right? Because there is that rapport that you have. Like when Mike and Russ showed up, it wasn't like, wow, how have you been for the last year? Even though it's yeah. been almost a year. I mean, we, we saw each other. It was March 12th and we knew that things weren't like right on that day. Uh, yep. you know, but it was March 12th was the last time that we all saw each other and play mute, played music together. And, um, but we've kept in touch. We've tried to do monthly ish zoom calls. We, we have a text trail that's just constantly full every few days. It flares up with some inane banter of some sort, but it's, it's just a connection. Right. So when we saw each other, it was like, Hey, we, you know, it was like a little weird cause we hadn't, you know, <laughs> seen each other. And so, yeah. but, but other than that weirdness, it really wasn't weird. Once we started playing music, it was like, Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. We've done this before. Like, this is great. It was, you know, it was just a night to hang out with each other. And we, by, by the way, we happened to play some music. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so and, and what we did was mostly play music for, for the record, but it was, you know, it was just an opportunity to get together and, and do a thing that we enjoy doing together. So yeah, no, it was good. It was, I knew it would be easier than, you know, like a theater gig or even, even like those bitter pill gigs. Cause you know, I hadn't played with them a bunch before the pandemic hit. We just, we didn't have years. I didn't have years with them of, of playing live. So every gig, even before the pandemic, every gig was like a thing that I have to think about and prepare for. And, and it's a little bit of a, you know, a test, uh, <laughs> if you will. Whereas playing a fling gig is is not that kind of a test for me. And bitter pill gigs will get there. Like I, that band's a great band. We will we will get. But it's just for, and and it's not them. It's it's me. You know. It's, it's I just need to do it more frequently. But we've you know fling's been through ups and downs. And you know we played. Did you say that there's any subtlety to the difference that the bitter pill band is basically a pit band? Oh no, that is bitter pill band's not a pit band. Okay, bitter pill band's a rock band. I mean, ish, it, it's like, it's a band. It, everyone hap most of the people happen. No, oh no, everyone it is, has done some musical theater stuff, but, but it's not a musical theater band. It's, I mean, it's a rock band that plays original music is, is right. what it is. Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's not a pit band by any stretch. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty straight ahead rock band it, from, from that standpoint. It's a, it's a quite unique scenario but just based on the instrumentation and the way the songs are worked but but no it's just a band in in that way yeah yeah i'm looking and i'm looking forward to playing more bitter pill gigs i mean that's that's i honestly i think it's interesting as as the pandemic started i remembered saying i don't know what the future of that band holds now i'm i'm far more bullish on that band than pretty much any other band that i'm in i i think that's the band that's going to come out of of pandemic here roaring I think it's, I think it's, it's going to do great, which is cool, which will be fun. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But, um, 
Monday, a week ago, Monday was also the first test of the no PA setup. I have no more mixer in this room, Paul. I, I run, ev I ran everything and now run everything through logic on my computer. I have 24 ins and outs with that, um, personas. It's all sort of headed by this personas quantum 2626, which is a thunderbolt interface. It's an eight channel. It's got eight ins and outs on it. And then it's got light pipes to go to two other interfaces. So I can have actually three, if you count spit if, so I can go, I've got it set up with 24 ins and outs. And, um, I will say that it is the best, clearest, most feedback resistant setup I've ever had in this room. Mm. Uh, I don't, and I'm not quite sure why it's so feedback resistant. I, I have to wonder if it is the, Thunderbolt is really low latency, like one to two milliseconds is is where these things are rated. Uh, and you certainly the only don't thing that's, that's hear. different is you're going you're going into a computer instead of, instead of into a physical mixer, mm -hmm. and you're not actually pumping any any sound back to the any air back to the musicians. Everybody's in headphones. No, I I, I use ears as I always have in here, but but otherwise, no. I've got uh, I've got three speakers in the room to uh, two Mackie. SRM 350s and uh, the Mackie Reach is in here too. So yeah, no, it's it's like it's it's loud. It's you know it's a rock band. In fact, we were running bass through the system too because I don't have a bass amp in the room, so we just plug. So when you say in. the no PA setup, the, really the the distinction is that you're not using a physical mixer. That's really the difference. That's correct. Okay. Yes. Yeah. That's a fair. That's right. Yeah. 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 Um, but I wonder if the the you know, the one to two millisecond latency of the Thunderbolt interface actually provides a better, a less feedback prone scenario because it's not that immediate thing, right? Feedback is when the signal is the same going through and through and through. And I, I, I mean, I don't know what the reason is, but, but I wonder if, if that's part of it because it's, I can, I mean, it tuning the EQ was, I mean, certainly I could tune it and get feedback to happen, but, uh, but it was really easy to tune the room and, and get things like loud and clear and all nice. of that good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. The distortion. I mean, there's just no, maybe that's what it is. Maybe it's these, these mic pre's and stuff that there's just, the distortion is so low compared to, you know, a, a whatever, a 10 year old analog mixer that I had in here before. Maybe that's so what it is. So this was fling fling light this was three fifths of three fling, fifths of fling. fling that's correct yeah. yeah yeah say that 10 times fast <laughs> <laughs> well cool and um was this a let's just rock and just have some fun was this uh let's see if we remember where our places are in the harmonies i mean this was the three singers in fling right uh no it was it, fling everybody sings in fling if if i had to pick three the three fifths of the singers, it would be me, Mike and Aaron and, and then Burke and then Russ, uh, in that order. Actually, it would be Aaron, Mike, Dave, Burke, Russ in that order. But, um, so, so no, it, it, I mean, it was Mike and I sang pretty much everything. I think there was one tune that Russ sang, uh, as we were, as we were running through, but it was, it was, it was a little bit of everything you just said. It was certainly the, the foundation of it was, there are no expectations and no one needs to know what happened in this room. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so we just, you, you know, we played, but, but there were moments of like, Oh, wait, 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 how do we do that? Okay. Yeah. 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 Let's, let's, let's work that out. And yeah, we'd put some harmonies together and things like that. And you know, the one side benefit, and I'm so glad we were maybe 20 minutes from finishing that first night and it hit me. It was like, wait a minute. This is all my mixer is logic. All I have to do is hit the red button and I've got a multi-track recording of everything we've done. <laughs> so we did some recording and I put put together some mixes and we were all okay with it. And I shared them with the other bandmates and of a couple of nice. tunes. So, you know, it was like, and that opens up huge doors for when we can get everybody back together. It's just the ability to, you know, on a whim say, all right, let's track that, you know, if we're working on a new tune an arrangement of something or whatever, it's like, all right, let's just track that real quick so we don't forget it and, and then move on to the next thing. And then, and then I can, you know, come and do a rough mix and send out the, the MP3 to the guys and be like, all right, yeah, here's the, the three things we wanted to sort of revisit from rehearsal. 
having yeah. that for a multi-track. And I mean, these are, I've got eight mics on my drums alone. So like, these are pretty good multi-tracks. There's some bleed because it's, it's allowed, you know, things are loud in the room, but it's pretty good. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't bad. So the worst part about it was us. So that's, you know, well, you know, it's kind of like what I was talking about last week about how, you know, what I want is to not think about the stuff. I want to hit a button. Yeah. And go, right. And that's really one of the hard, you know, hard things about, about recording rehearsals is like, if you're not set up for it, probably the SPL in a room is hard to do with just like an iPhone, you know, mic. Oh yeah. That. Yeah. That's tough. Right. Yeah. And you know, and if it's not good, then no one's going to listen to it and you know, that type of thing. So that would be, you know, there's, there's this kind of sense of what is, what is the stage of tomorrow, you know, like, and what is the practice facility of tomorrow? I mean, now that we can have mixers in laptops um, and the inherent benefit of that, you know, are, are many things, including, you know, other things we can do with whatever signal comes into the laptop. Is that really what, you know, what we, you know, in 10 years, will everybody be using in five years? Will everybody be doing that? Sure. Yeah, it could be, I, I you know, I don't know. It, it's, I, I mean, if you look at, if you look at our digital mixer lineup that that's out there now, that's not all that much different from what I'm doing. Right. I mean, it's, you're, you're using, uh, it's all going digital anyway in a, you know, in a, uh, like the, the, we use the Mackie DL series mm -hmm. a lot for live, but, but the same would be true with the Behringer, the Midas, you know, the 32 series that they have. I mean, it's, these are all just digital units. They're just purpose built digital units as opposed to a laptop, which is, you know, you got to run the app. This has the, those have the app running already. So I don't, I don't know that that part of it changes I think we've already seen that change on the mixer side of things. Maybe. Um, yeah. I don't know. Uh, it, it gets interesting, uh, it, you know? Yeah. I don't know. That's, that's interesting. We have, we have some, some, well, we had a comment from last week's show and then I found uh well, two things I want to talk about and maybe that'll lead us into another part of the stage of tomorrow. Sound good. I love it. All right. So uh, Johnny D commented on last week's episode. We were talking about uh, you mentioned that you got your spark and he said he too picked up a spark. He says he also picked up a boss ACS pro, which is, as he says, a great acoustic camp. He says, I love it as much as I love the spark. And this, I took a look. Do you know about this ACS Pro, Paul? I do not. This Take thing look looks, yeah, this looks interesting. It's the, it, it, it stands for Acoustic Singer Pro. And it's, it's a little, it's a little amp. It's got a plug-in for your, your guitar. And then it's got a combo XLR quarter inch jack for a microphone, right? So it's, it's, it's your PA in the shape of a, you know, little combo amp and you've got, different levels of, you know, completely different lines for both for EQ and they've got an anti-feedback mechanism. It's even got a looper in it on the guitar side and a wow. harmonizer on the vocal side. Wow. So, yeah. So I know it's a, it's a pretty, so I use, I use that boss, you know, tower thing. Yeah. And you know, the boss mixer technology with all the, um, with all the presets they have for different acoustic guitars and different microphones takes care of that part of it, but, you know, but also that's going to be, you know, a minimum of nine ninety nine up to twenty four ninety nine. you know, to get your guitar, two guitars and vocal into it, you know, and it'll sound absolutely fantastic. Sure. But once you add things like you add this, you know, harmonizers and that type of stuff, that's actually really interesting. And so this is 400 bucks for the ACS pro, right? Like I'm looking that's at 700 bucks. Oh, am I looking at the wrong one on Sweetwater here? Well, I see 120 watts. Maybe there's different sizes. Oh, maybe, maybe, maybe. Hang on. ACS Pro, Acoustic Singer Pro. The one I found on Sweetwater. Oh, yeah, 120 watts. Okay, so let's let's see. Let's see where we can buy this. Um, a little looper and a and a harmonizer. So basically, adding in. You know, TC has that Voice Live three. Box, yeah, there it is, seven hundred bucks. You're right. I, I was looking at what must have been the previous model that doesn't have the looper or harmonizer. Uh, Got it. So yeah, seven hundred bucks. But still, like that's that's a good little. If it works, and Johnny D says it works, like that's nice. That's a great. Yeah, like you said, not only is it compact, but 
but budget efficient for for what it is. Yeah. So that's pretty good. I also yep. stumbled onto this thing, Paul, called the Jam Stack. I got a uh, actually. I think I got a note from them. It's they call it the world's most portable guitar amp, and it is. It's an amp that looks like it clips on to where you're like to your strap lock on the back of your guitar and then plugs right in and it's got a little speaker there and uh, that's it. It's it's an attachable guitar amplifier. I don't think it's quite ready yet. I think you're it's in pre-orders through an Indiegogo mm -hmm. thing, but um, but we'll keep an eye on what they're doing there. It seems pretty interesting. Yeah, I haven't heard about that. Yeah. See it though. Yeah, it's when pretty cool, right? Yeah, a travel guitar amp is what they kind of bill it as. Yeah, I think that's the right way of thinking of it. That's right. It has a looper. It does. Okay. Huh? Yeah. All right. Yeah. And does it look like it does a little bit of modeling. Oh, no kidding. Huh? Yeah. Wow. That's pretty cool. Very cool. Yeah, Jamstack. cool idea. Jamstack.io. Yeah. Jamstack.io. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. It looks right. a little odd to connect something to your actual guitar itself, but, you know, I guess you can get over that. Maybe may, maybe you can get over it. You know, that's yeah. that's the thing to test. Yeah. Um, I realized something during our, our fling rehearsals that for whatever reason, despite the fact that I have, I, I lead a charmed life. Okay. So I'm extremely spoiled, especially in the regard, in regards to in-ear monitors. Right. Um, I, I have probably at the moment, 10 sets of IEMs that, that are in full, like workable, gigable condition and are all great quality. And, you know, probably of a retail price is 700 bucks and up. Um, I, I, for whatever reason, as I've been recording tracks here in the studio, back in June, July, maybe, we talked about Mackie's MP240 universal fit in-ear monitors. So they're in-ear monitors, but they're they're universal fit. They're not custom fits. And uh, the 240s are their hybrid. So it's got a balanced armature and a dynamic driver in there. And that's what, for whatever reason, that's what I've been using every time I, I sit at the drums and track things. I pop them in, I use them, I come back over to the computer, I you know mix it or whatever. And I, because that's been my habit, when Fling showed up the other day, I sat down at my drums, I grabbed the MP240s, I plugged them in and I used them. And I did that again on Monday night. And it was halfway through Monday. I thought, why am I using these things? Like I have things that, that are, you know, on paper so much better. And these are really, they are not, if you were to listen to music on these compared to, you know, music on, on like my ultimate ears, 11 pros or whatever, uh, you would definitely say, okay, well this has a more full sound or this, that, and the other thing. But the EQ pattern on these two forties is really built in a way that it makes it easy to hear what I need to hear. It's got like a little bit of extra bite at like that, you know, high mid at like six K and, and it, and a plenty of low end so I can hear the bass and feel the bass and, and the kick drum and all that stuff. And so I, I've really found them to be, I, I know I said good things about them when we talked about them in July, but it just surprised me that it's like, wait, these have become my go-to mm. here in the studio when I'm sitting in my drums. They, they seal really well. They've got, you know, I, I put the, the silicone tips on them that came with them and, and they, you know, I got put the right ones in for my ears pro tip, by the way. If you're using, you know, tips on your earbuds, which most earbuds do, uh, your ears are probably not the same size as one another. So it does, it would make perfect sense to use like a small in one ear and a medium in the other or whatever it works out to be. So if you find something that works for one ear, don't feel like you have to use the same size in the other. So there's my pro my pro tip for today. Yeah. But yeah, these things sound good. They I, I think they sent you a set too, right, Paul? Did I, did, yeah. am I remembering that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, they were a little um, flat and, um, yeah. you know, for, for my, for my taste, you know, the lows didn't really bounce for me, but, um, you know, for the price point, they were really interesting. Right. Uh, and I and liked them better for not pre-recorded music than I, than I did for playing my own music. That's, and that's the, that's really the thing is I, yeah, I don't think they would not be my preference for pre-recorded music at all, but for a monitor while I'm playing, They've been great. They, I get everything I need out of them. I don't feel like I have to crank them up to, to hear. So yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, pre-show we, you, <laughs> you got us on a, 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 a thought about in-ears and the wires and all that stuff. You want to tee that up again, man? So I was just thinking about, we started an interesting conversation last week about, um, that 
something is happening in the in-ear market and that price points are bouncing all over the place. There's still, you know, 11 driver, super high, you know, 1,000 plus costs. Yep. But all of a sudden there's more like weekend warrior pricing things. And, the you know, people have been liking this. And then and actually one of our listeners actually shared a company that's doing custom in-ears, molded in-ears for under $200. And so I know you had a conversation with them. I'll let you fill people on that. But that just kind of like, what do we want? What, you know, what, what do you want on your stage, even as a as a weekend warrior? One of the things I think we want is less cables. We want less you know, if everything could be wireless and less stuff to pack up, unpack, you know, wires are not our friends really in this. They are reliable technology that we know are, are going to work unless we break them. But I mean, that's a huge part of the mess of playing on small stages and, you know, just what would we want a stage to look like moving forward. And wireless, I think, is a big part of that. And I don't know, you know, where where the world stands with you know, as we get these smarter mixers that have Wi-Fi technology, how much of it is a Wi-Fi problem? How much of it is a Bluetooth problem or opportunity? Um, and what other technologies need to be involved for us to have simplest walk-in and set up type of uh, stages that we could enjoy? Yeah. So when, you know, I, I lead I lead two lives, right? I, I am a geek about music and I'm also a geek about tech. And, and so whatever it was, three or four years ago when the what they call the true wireless, you know, earbud phase hit. It was a company called Earin, E-A-R-I-N, were the first ones to the market with what we now know as true wireless, like Air, Apple's AirPods and and everything else like that, where you've got two completely separate earbuds, no wires. They sit in your ear or like the AirPods, they hang out. But like the Earins sit right inside your ear, as do many others. And and that's it, right? They Bluetooth to your phone or whatever device you're playing and you have no wires and the batteries last many, many, many hours, you know, five to seven hours and, and all that stuff. And it's great. And so like when that first hit, I was super excited about it from, you know, the techie geeky side, but also I started wondering like, just like you, Paul, like, when do I get to have in-ear monitors with no cord? Because even if I have a wireless in-ear pack, it's still a cord from my ears down to the pack, right? And I don't like that. I, I hate that cord. Um, mm -hmm. And so it was like, what's the deal? And the problem is blue. Well, latency versus battery. So Bluetooth obviously works fine with battery life. You can get, you know, five hours, let's say minimum battery life out of, uh, you know, an in-ear that has, that has Bluetooth in it. So that's great. Even if you could just get three hours out of it, like that might be enough. You charge on set breaks and you're good, right? Uh, but the problem is Bluetooth is terrible with audio latency. If you've ever tried to do a Zoom call and use your AirPods as your Bluetooth thing, you can do it, but you've probably noticed that you wind up talking over each other. It's why Paul and I use wired microphones and earphones when we do this podcast, because you think we talk each uh, over each other now, it would be <laughs> terrible because there would be huge amounts of latency, right? And by latency, I mean the delay between when something is either sent from the computer or from my voice to when the computer gets it or when my ears get it. And with Bluetooth, that latency is usually in the two to 300 millisecond range. There's some where it can be between 100 and 200 that's a lot. That's a tenth or two tenths of a second. Anything above about, let's say 50, and I'm being generous, anything above 50 milliseconds is completely perceptible to the human ear uh, and will throw you off. And, and obviously when you're playing music it would be terrible because now you'd be literally out of sync with, with your bandmates because you'd be playing to what you're hearing in your ear, which is 50 milliseconds after, you know, they played it. And of course, if they're on the same problem, you know, and we're not just talking 50, we're talking hundreds. So, you know, you've now got to, let's say it's 200 milliseconds. So I play something, you play along to me, Paul, but now you're hearing it 200 milliseconds after I played it, you play it. Now I hear you 200 milliseconds after you play it. And so now there's almost half a second of wishy-washy lag. And now you understand why we're not jamming over Zoom. So, um, so there's this latency problem. However, Wi-Fi is really fast and efficient with this. It doesn't have the same issues with latency. But the problem with Wi-Fi is 
it's really yeah. power. Can, yeah. Power hungry. So certainly you can have Wi-Fi in your phone. That's fine. But look at the size of the battery in your phone versus the size of the battery that could fit in your ears. And you start to develop like th there's this problem, right? It's, it's this corner that you keep winding up in. Like how big do these in-ears need to be in order for them to have Wi-Fi in them? And of course, most people don't care about this. So there's the cost factor too, or the economy of scale factor. Because to develop Bluetooth earphones, like the market's huge. It's not just musicians. In fact, it's not musicians. I mean, it might be musicians listening to music, but it's not musicians on stage. But it's anybody that wants to listen to music without wires. So that's a huge market, it turns out, right? Well, musicians on stage is a small market to begin with. And now you say, okay, what's the market for developing you know, a true wireless in-ear monitor on stage. Like now you're at this really, really small market. Nobody's spending the money to do this. People are, but it's not I, like every time I talk to people and ask the question, I'm like, yeah, you know, we've talked about this and <laughs> it never quite gets there. So, mm -hmm. but it might like there, there is a codec for Bluetooth. The problem with Bluetooth is the bandwidth is so limited that audio has to be compressed to send over it. And that also means it has to be decompressed when it gets to your ears. And so that takes time too, unless you want to put a super powerful uh, chip inside the ears. And now that takes more battery, right? So you're, you're constantly fighting this battle, but it, it's, it's like theoretically doable. There's this Bluetooth codec called Aptex low latency that could theoretically begin to solve these problems. I, I think someday we will have it, but as I understand it, no one has really made a prototype that actually does it. People have gotten close and I could be, I mean, obviously there's stuff that goes on in the, in the world. I don't know about it turns out, but, um, but I haven't met anybody that's like, oh yeah, dude, we've made it work. Now we just got to figure out how to make it cost effective or something like that. So Dave, if you fly with me back, back up to 10,000 feet, get, sure. get away from the minutia and just think, you know, what are the things that, that like. When I look at Bill setting up our stage, right? Yeah. He has to run power everywhere. So I, you know, I want less AC power things. I want better batteries built into better things, right? I want yep. my amp to have a super duper battery that lasts a super duper long time and, you know, has no effect on performance of the amp and that type of thing. And that would be huge if you didn't have to run power to every corner of the stage and it, or every 10, every four feet of the stage for 10 musicians. That would be huge in terms of setup time and teardown time. Well, you can and, solve that you know, problem now. Throw your amp away. Plug direct. <laughs> no, could. seriously. But it, Well, you could. And then you kind of get into, the, you know, like what I want is what I want. I like I my amp. Right? <laughs> right, you know, so right. I want everything, right? Yeah, I want yeah, my yeah, amp yeah. to sound like my amp. And then, and then there's, you know, all the mic cables. And then, you know, wow. so then there's, you know, how many wireless mics can you have? And, and the technology to manage interference and all those types of things and the changing landscape of, of wireless technology. And, and then there's monitors. And, you know, so I would like, I would like cl a very clean stage with, with, with more room for my feet and less, less chance for me to trip or step on something. Right. Yeah. And that's what I think the stage of tomorrow is going to look like. And, you know, we sort of see this stuff like I, I in the guitar world, um, guitar wireless has gone from kind of like, you know, amp size, you know, receivers um, to, and, you know, kind of like deck of card size transmitters to like little bugs that literally plug yeah. in. Yeah. Why not, why not build that stuff into the guitar itself? Right. You oh, know, that's interesting. That, right. Yeah. Less wires, less power. I, yeah, I will, I will say this. I have a set of Eames drums that I had built for me in let's say 1996 six or something. I don't know. Some, sometime, long time ago. And when I had it built, I was super gaga over in like built in microphones. And I, and I wound up going with, with a built in mic inside the kick. I put it, I had a D one twelve. this company called may. I don't think they're around anymore, but they made a mount that was built to hold a microphone inside your, your bass drum and it supports it in there. And it's been great. Like I still use it to this day whatever they did, you know, to make those things solid worked like it's, you know, decades later and it's still rock solid. And it was great. It was a custom built set of drums so I could have them drill all the holes I wanted. 
and this was one of them. So I have a little XLR port on the side of my kick drum and that's all you have to do. You plug into that. The mic's in exactly the right spot a hundred percent of the time. And it sounds great. Uh, except when I use a different bass drum and then it's like, well, this sucks. I own a D one twelve, but I cannot use it on any other drum. So I have to buy another bass drum mic <laughs> so that I can mic that bass drum. Right. And, and so the idea of putting stuff inside, and I don't regret by the way, what I've done, it's awesome. Especially on small stages, you talk about tripping over things. I can't tell you how many times I'd get to the end of a set and realized, you know, the bass player, the guitar player had like kicked the kick drum mic over and it was in the wrong spot or, you know, whatever. Um, yeah. It's great for that. But, it, you know, the same with your guitar. Like if there's something that you could just plug into any guitar, making it more universal, I, I feel like there's a, there's a benefit there. Cause that way you're not stuck with only the guitars that have that in them. You know, you, huh? right. You find some vintage guitar and you're like, great. I plug my new fangled thing into this vintage thing and I'm good to go. So I, I think, I think your answer, like I, I, I remember watching some of those videos from uh, uh, Meblin, Dan Meblin uh, the, with his pop fiction band. And I think they are a mostly ampless yeah. stage. Yeah. Right. And I, I think there's like, and, and to be honest, most touring rock bands, not most, many touring rock bands are ampless stages. They might put amps on the stage so that you see them. But the reality is like everything's going through a, you know, it, it might not even be going through those amps. Processing. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's right. It's being processed and there you go. So I, I think there's, I, I think that might be the, I mean, certainly in terms of what's available today, that's the answer is, is, you know, committing to that wireless ampless stage and getting, you're not going to get a hundred percent there, right? Your in-ears are going to have a wire to your belt pack, uh, but then, you know, your belt pack is wireless, so you're good to go there. You are trading managing cables and power, uh, AC power, for managing batteries. And now you're talking lots of batteries. So, you know, you have to be proactive thinking about that. I think about, you know, backstage at a theater show when there's, you know, 25 lav mics or something yeah. that they're, you know, and it's, it's like, okay, you know, we did sound check or whatever. Everybody make sure you've got new batteries. And it's like a whole process and it's fine. Like it's part of the, it's part of the production, but it is part of the production that batteries must be managed before and after every show and like that, you know, that sort of thing. But it does make the stage easier to set up and a whole lot cleaner. So I don't know with, with guess, no monitor wedges. It, yeah. That's pretty yeah. good. Yeah. I guess, you know, what drives this is what the gigs of the future look like. You know, mm. we're, we're looking at a model of, of, you know, clubs that rock bands go in and play or, or, you know, festivals, that rock bands, you know, the bands come in and, you know, you have some, some combination of acoustic noise making things like drums and horns and, and, you know, electronically or electrically generated sound. And, you know, you got to get it all blended and you got to get it all, you know, comfortable for everybody. So, I, I still think there's, there's more work to do and there's more opportunities. Totally. You know, wireless technology is cool. You know, any guitar player would tell you the first time that you go wireless and you can walk away from your amp is the most bizarrely liberating thing that you can feel. But, um, you know, there's more to it, right? Totally. And, uh, and, yeah. and getting it seamless and getting it, you know, and we had this conversation. You remember the conversation we had was like, the gigs of tomorrow are lower volume gigs. And so being those ampless entities or, and knowing how to be an ampless entity that will get you more business. If you're looking at what types of gigs yeah, totally. it will be tomorrow. So yeah, yeah. I, I, I tend, I agree. So, so, there's, so there's kind of a, a Delta where both of our ideas are coming together. It's mm -hmm. like, yes, you know, I've invested a lot in regular amps that push air and it's tearful for me to say goodbye to those things. Of course. <laughs> but yeah. you know, uh, you know, I also, I, I want to play and I want to, you know, and I want it and I want what I want. I want it to be easier. Right. Right. And so, you know, I guess in the same way that in-ears are better for my voice and, you know, just letting go of old habits is just a hard thing. Well, that's, I think that's a big part of it for all of us. I mean, we've, how many episodes have we talked about how difficult the transition is when going to in-ears, right? I mean, it's a... Right. It's a, it's a regular topic when, when we're out there gigging and actually doing this, it's, and it, you know, it took me a full year before I was even beginning to be comfortable. And, and even now, like I, I now, if, if the pandemic has been good for one thing, 
It's that all of the gigs, I haven't been playing nearly as many gigs for obvious reasons, but for whatever reason, all the gigs that I've played during the pandemic have been so, I think it's because everything's so meticulously organized. Nothing is thrown together, you know, because we've got to think about so many other factors now that the idea of, Hey, can I get my in-ears to run is never a problem. It's like, Oh, of course, like that's way better. Now, you know, you don't have to have a wedge near you, which means I don't need to yeah. bring a wedge near you. Right. Like there's all that stuff. And so every gig that I've done has not only been like possible to do in ears, but it's, you know, to, to like steal a phrase from the business world, it's in ears first, right? Like that is the, ex that is the expectation. And because of that, the mixes have been better. I've done stereo in ears for most gigs, which again, seems so radically crazy. But, be and because of that, I've been like, I don't remember the last time I took an ear out to hear something, you know, it was like mid fling rehearsal this week. And I was like, I, I, you know, should I take, like, I was having a little trouble hearing a thing. It was like, oh, I guess I could take an ear out to do that, but I haven't done that. It's been so long, you know? So I've, I've, it, it, I guess what I'm saying is it's a hard transition. You know, I'm what, 20 years into the in-ear thing. And it's still like, oh yeah, I can leave them both in for a whole gig. Like that's a novel concept to me and not a concept, yeah. but you know, practice for me. So yeah, it's, yeah, it'll take change, It you know, but, but you know, if the pandemic has done anything for us, it has forced change upon us. So we can, That's true. we can resist it or we can say, all right, this is what, this is the hand we're dealt. Let's leverage this. Let's use the, the opportunity to make some changes and let's make those changes. Like you said, the, the quieter stages of tomorrow, it's been a long time since any of us have been on a loud stage, right? Like that's not a bad thing. I agree with you. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know. Jump in. Uh, what's What did you say? Jump in. Jump in. That's it. Yeah, right. Jump in. So um, we will talk more about them because we're we're getting some to test out. But just so as to not bury the lead here, Paul, you mentioned the the, the sub two hundred dollar custom fit in ears. It's a company called Waves Custom at w a v s custom dot com. We'll put a link in the show notes. They're doing a very cool thing where you scan your ear with your iPhone. It uses the Face ID camera on your phone, which can do 3D mapping. And you you scan your own ear, you send it in, and uh, and then they 3D print your molds and send those out to you. So it's a whole, like, talk about taking, you know, a, an industry and turning it upside down. That's what they've done there. I'm really curious to, to check them out. And obviously, we'll let you folks know what we... Uh, what we think of them once the uh, once they arrive, but I didn't want to. I didn't. If if I was listening to a podcast and they said, "Yeah, sub two hundred dollar in ears," and then never told me the name, what? I'd be pissed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so now I'm looking forward to this. They were really nice guys, very helpful yeah. with getting the scanning done. Yeah. So uh, I am cautiously optimistic this is going to be, and that's kind of a game changer at that price point. Custom because I think custom molds are a huge part of the equation. Sure. Um, you know, for for getting comfortable. And, you know, deciding how much seal you want, um, you know, for, as for, like you've said, guitar, guitar players have a harder time than most uh, transitioning in years. Yeah. And I think, a, you know, really well fit one. If you can do that for this price, amazing. Yeah, I know. I'm really eager to check these out. So, yeah. All right. Well, that's what we got. You got anything else, man? We good? No, man. Here we go. Happy 2021. Happy 2021. And, uh, did you know, actually, real quickly, did you know that Gibson acquired Mesa Boogie? I don't think I did know that. No. So that's, you know, a big thing. And actually, I, I bring up Gibson because Gibson, I thought all they the guitar were dead, lines, right? Um, Randall Smith went to work for them as a master designer. And, and uh, so the, the brand will live on as the Mesa Boogie brand. And, you know, or uh, actually, it's not clear if it's going to be a Gibson custom shop. But I think that's kind of interesting. You know, it looks like Gibson's new management is really aggressively trying to do some cool things. And so, you know, Gibson was maligned for a while and out of business, you know, yeah. on the, their toes on verge of being out of business. I think that's a pretty cool um brand partnership for them to have taken on. Yeah. Mesa Boogie is one of those. They're, they're, you know, I, I, I put, yeah, but they're like the, when I was coming up, it was, they were one of those brands that people talked about in hush tones. It was like, Oh, the guy's got a Mesa Boogie amp like those. Yeah. Really nice. well, they're the Same original as, boutique amp. They beat the original boutique. It was like Mesa Boogie amps and PRS guitars were like, Oh, if dude, this, that dude's got those yeah. like that dude, he must know what he's doing, you know? So yeah, that's um, that. Yeah. That's a good brand for them to, to have. Yeah. I like it. 
And one other piece of news today that I'll just share just before you set out is yeah. Universal Audio, who, uh, you know, I have their interface. They got into the guitar pedal market today, and it's always a really interesting thing. So, you know, they, they, their Universal Audio's thing is uh, making hardware with digital technology sound as analog as possible. That's, that's kind of their, okay. their goal in life is to, you know, when you record and you want it to sound analog, but you have to go through a whole bunch of digital stuff, they are the masters of that. Now they're applying that expertise to guitar pedal technology they came out with three pedals and the you know the guitar pedal market is a wild wild thing i mean there's everything from you know chinese manufacturers with 19 dollars pedals to these pedals are 3.99 each so really high end their universal audio is talking about how again they're taking reverb modulation and echo uh and and uh that it'll sound as analog as you could want it to sound so wow. Uh, might be interesting to try that stuff out. That's really interesting. I see this. Yeah, it was just today. Wow. Huh. All right. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. That's pretty yeah, cool. Stuff going on. So, so this is their. They've taken their 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 digital magic that they've built into their plugins and interfaces over the years, and now put this inside pedals. Is that essentially what's happening here? Is that what I, I think so. Although yeah. I saw a little bit of their of their press event today, oh. and the um. CEO of TC Electronics was involved, so it might be a partnership with TC. But you know, TC and Electronics is a is a uh, Behringer. You, 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 it's one of Uli Behringer's ba brands, right? Oh, I didn't know that. I, I think so. I think they are part of what is that called? Music Group now, or or something? Yeah, the Music Tribe. That's right. Yeah. So we will never talk to them. That company is super impossible to get in touch with. So uh, <laughs> if you ever want news about TC Electronics or Behringer or any of those things, we can tell you what we've used of their equipment because some of it is great. Uh, but those people, I've been literally trying for 10 years to get in touch with somebody there and it's like no bueno. And I've talked to people in the industry and they're like, good luck. I finally heard from their like head, head VP of marketing. I somehow came across his Gmail address. I'd been sending him stuff for the last five years. Not a peep. I sent him a thing. The last time we mentioned a Behringer thing on the show, Paul. And, uh, and he replied, he's like, I no longer work with Uli Behringer. And it was like, okay, so it <laughs> took you freaking quitting the company to reply to me. Like, that's crazy. But, um, but anyway, you know, but that, that's just a me problem. I guess. Maybe they take a death oath or something. I guess. What a weird thing. Like, you, you know, we, we were talking pre-show about how Apple's PR department is weird. A Apple's got nothing on Behringer because at least Apple talks to some people. Behringer, it seems like it's a freaking locked box. I don't know. It's and you uh, have said that the, the music industry is so different from the computer industry in terms of, you know, yes. access to yes. PR information and, you know, demo products and all that type of stuff. It's very different. I know, you know, it used to be once upon a time, you ask a company, say, Hey, I want to check out your product. You know, and if you had any leveraged audience to tell the, the, the about the product software would appear on your desk and, you know, in a matter of minutes. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's still the case on the tech side. The music right. side is, is it, the old school people on the music side are still very much like, no, 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 no. But, but there are some, that have that have come to live in in our current decade here that understand that yeah like it's it's this is how things get done there are, I mean especially this year there is no trade show for musicians to attend to go touch gear so how are they going to learn like you got to get this into people's hands that have you know that can tell people so yeah yeah anyway that's just a little rant i don't know where that came from but Anyway, <laughs> Universal Audio has been easy to, well, relatively easy to talk with. Like, yeah, no problem. So it's good. But not Behringer. I don't know what Uli does to his employees. Like you said, it might, might be a blood oath or something. <laughs> <laughs> I like that story. I'm going to stick with it. In fact, I think the next time I reach out to them, I might ask, like, I, can you set aside your blood oath for just five minutes to reply to this email? That might be a funny thing to ask. All right. Well, now do we have anything else? Now that I've gotten myself Sorry. in trouble with just about everybody. No. Everybody. <laughs> nope. Now we're good. Okay. On your way. Yeah. I was like, all right. Well, I need, Vaya con Dios. <laughs> need to shut my mouth before I get in more trouble. Thanks for listening, folks. Feedback. I'm the only one here next week. You know why. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Feedback. Hey, Dave. Yeah, yeah. Feedback at geekoutpodcast.com. You know What's that, Paul? When those PR people call you, just tell them that you were always performing, right? That's what I'm doing. <laughs>